Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, our first item this evening is a presentation I'd like to ask that by students from the Coquitlam School District, and it concerns the Real Active Caring Week. I was about to invite, invite Ms. Harriet Chang forward, but I've been informed that it's the kids themselves and no adult supervision. This sounds like fun. Hello, my name is Taryn Chang, and I'm in grade four at Panorama Heights. Hi, my name is Emily Rao. I'm in grade four at Panorama Heights. Hi, my name is Casey L. Chin. I'm in grade five at Hampton Park Elementary. Hi, my name is Hannah Tyndall. I'm in grade five, and I go to Hampton Park Elementary School. Hi, my name is Katie Salvador. I'm in grade four and I go to Hampton Park Elementary School. Hi, my name is Solomon and Neen. I'm in grade four and I go to Hampton Park Elementary School. I'm just gonna interrupt for a moment. I see a bunch of parents and if you want, there's some places to stand back here for photos if they'd prefer, it's up to you. Go right ahead. Let's begin. Students in the Coquitlam School District are celebrating a special Relapse of Caring Week once again during the week of February 14th to 20th, 2010 this year. What is Relapse of Caring? Relapse of Caring is about doing something kind for and caring for another and not expecting anything back in return. A real act of caring is about making a, a positive difference for another. A real act of caring is about helping somebody if they need it. A real act of caring is about making our world a better place. This is the fifth year that students have been involved in spreading caring and kindness in the Tri-Cities in British Columbia in February each year. Students have been lobbying with the local and provincial governments since 2006. To have a special Caring and Kindness Week with us. Rack Week is getting bigger and better. We are asking you to celebrate this special Caring and Kindness Week with us again this year during February 14th to 20th, 2010. At the same time that we will be celebrating our Caring and Kindness Week during February 14th to the 20th, the Olympics will be taking place. We will be hosts to guests from all over the world. What a great time to be practicing caring and kindness towards others. This is a chance for us to show our visitors how wonderful Canada is and how special the people who live here are. Examples of a real act of caring, smiling and saying hello, saying something caring and kind to another person, helping someone carry something, letting someone go ahead of you in a lineup. I bet you can think of some if you want to. Please do them now that you have thought of them. We have all learned that when we do something kind for another, it makes them really feel good, but it makes us even feel better. <laughs> we do a real act of caring today. Thank you, Mayor Stewart and City Council members for inviting us. I want to thank you all for coming. This is a great event. All of you, thank you for coming. This is a great evening. Each year we get to hear from some students about kindness and about caring. And I know Council wants to embrace those philosophies. I know that you'll you watch tonight, you'll see a kind and caring Council. Well, mostly. 
we will, um, we all adults ought to be able to listen to this message and you're right. This uh, it makes a better world and I thank you very much for coming out today. And we hope to see all the students uh, on February 11th, of course, the torch relay is coming through Coquitlam and the Tri-Cities and ending up in, at Mackin Park. On the morning of February 11th, between 8 and 10, we're going to have a celebration uh, that's enormous. Uh, so we wish you, hope you can all join us. Thank you so much for coming out today. Mr. Kirk. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Next item, item two, uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Darcy Rhoda, uh, who's currently with the Burnaby Express, but I think he has an announcement that will change that particular designation. Thank you very much, Your Worship, Council. It's really indeed a pleasure for me to be here tonight. And I've got some people with me that are joining me with part of this presentation. Come on up, please. This is Terrell and Reburn. She's our Sales and Marketing Director with Express Organization. Two of our key players will be with this organization next year, counting on them big time. Forward Garrick Perry, defenseman Simon Denny. One of my partners since day one, a great supporter of junior A hockey, Pat Elisalle, and the commissioner of the British Columbia Hockey League who resides in Coquitlam, like myself, John Grisdale. I would first of all really like to thank some people from the city of Coquitlam. Your Worship, first of all you. You and I met back in September. We had a, a great conversation and I could just see the passion in your eyes to bring junior hockey back to Coquitlam. So I, I thank you very much for that. I'd also like to thank Laurie McKay for your involvement through this process. Heath Mahoney, who we're working with very closely with at the Sports Centre. Wayne Beggs, thank you for your involvement through this process. But also, most of all, I'd like to thank Joyce Fordyce. Joyce and I go way back. She loves junior hockey, loves hockey, and Joyce and I had many meetings through this process. We had group meetings. And Joyce, thank you for your great support and involvement through this process and this exciting announcement we're going to make very soon. I also would like to thank Coquitlam Minor Hockey Association for their involvement through this process, the Coquitlam Senior Adnacks, how they've been involved in supporting Express Hockey coming back. I'd like to call upon my partner, who is just a, a fantastic giver to young men to reach their goals in hockey and education, Pat Lissell. Pat DeLassell, say a few words and make the official announcement. Pat? Thank you, Darcy, Your Worship, uh, Councillors. I also want to echo a lot of thanks to a lot of people here. Um, the encouragement from Joyce, day one, has been absolutely fabulous. Uh, back in the old days when she was at the rink, her and I would butt heads occasionally. Uh, but she's a real trooper, she's a real giver, and has never wavered from doing anything other than a great job for Coquitlam, and you should be proud of her. Um, I don't know a lot of you people here, but coming back to Coquitlam is, uh, is fantastic. That's where our roots started. When Darcy called me when we order, uh, opened the uh, new franchise, uh, we were delighted. We had a good run. Unfortunately, there were some issues with the building and what have you, which made us look alternatively. We now look back at uh, Burnaby, and it's been a ride, and we are so looking forward to coming back to Coquitlam and providing young men and great talent to the city of Coquitlam. And we will wear those uniforms proudly when we tour British Columbia on behalf of Coquitlam. So uh, on an official note, um, I would like to thank everyone here for letting us come back to Coquitlam, and we are now called the Coquitlam Express. One final note, uh, we are very proud of the British Columbia Hockey League. It is recognized amongst hockey circles as the finest junior A hockey league in Canada. We send more players off to college scholarships than any other league in Canada. We also have many NHL scouts and personnel at our games and we're led by a fantastic leader, a Coquitlam resident, John Grisdale. So on behalf of our league and the Coquitlam Express, your worship, councillors, we're really excited to be home. Thank you very much. Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm reading from a card that uh, you handed out uh, earlier this evening 
And it says simply, we're looking forward to coming home to Coquitlam. And most importantly, the Coquitlam Express logo. Uh, it's different, though, than my, my golf shirt. I, I was telling the story before. I bought a golf shirt at their last game in Coquitlam. Um, it wasn't to have a historical element. It's because I knew you'd be back, and also because I got the golf shirt at half price, and I am Scottish. Um, and so we're looking forward to it. I see one of our councillors, Councillor Reamer, is actually wearing her Coquitlam Express jersey from way back when. Well done. So I thank you very much. On behalf of Council, I, I certainly extend all of our uh, uh, best wishes for a tremendous season next year. Uh, great to have you back home. We've done a lot of work at a, a facility, and I, uh, Councillor McDonnell was uh, outside earlier. He's a chair of, and a driving force behind some of the improvements we've made for, in the physical plant for sporting in Coquitlam, and I want to acknowledge those improvements that staff have worked on to make sure that the Express could come back. Well, not just for that, but certainly uh, uh, we're glad to have you home. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Glad to have you home from Burnaby, and that's all I'm going <laughs> to. That's all I'm going to say about Burnaby. Okay, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just perhaps before proceeding on to item three, um, there's uh, been indicated need to speak to West, Westwood Golf Course, and I believe that Your Worship has some introductory remarks followed by some staff remarks. Thank you very much. This issue has been uh, raised by a number of members of our community, and as is the mayor's prerogative, I wanted to raise it tonight. Um, some members of our community have expressed concern that one of the actions that had been recommended by in a staff report um, might lead to something other than what council had intended. Um, the uh, action in question is the, uh, the change in designation at the regional level, at the regional plan level, um, for the Westwood Plateau Golf and Country Club. And the concern that uh, some residents expressed was that that could lead to uh, um, the elimination of golfing up there and the replacement of that with uh, some development. And that certainly is not council's intent. And in fact, uh, it, it's not going to happen if I'm here. I've count, I, speaking to my colleagues, each one of them expressed exactly the same sentiment, kind of, uh, I mean, over my dead body. This is not uh, aimed at trying to develop any, any golf course. The, I expect the 50 years from now, uh, when I finally retire from this job, um, I'll be golfing on Westwood Plateau Golf and Country Club because my back will be better But then. But I do want to ask uh, our staff to give some of the technical uh, issues associated with this because there are um, some um, significant technical uh, issues that we have to address uh, as a city. And uh, so I'm going to ask Mr. Steblin for his comments, please. Uh, thank you, Mayor Stewart. Uh, just, uh, just to reiterate, uh, we became aware that there were some significant community concerns uh, just starting uh, mid, uh, uh, middle to the later part of last week uh, on an issue that uh, has been studied by Metro Vancouver for uh, a number of years now. And we just wanted to highlight uh, s some clarifications to offset any inaccurate information that may be circulating in the community. Uh, and, and that uh, potentially that these golf courses uh, are being considered uh, for some sort of uh, uh, redevelopment for or proposals in that regard. Uh, we have to say that nothing is further uh, from the truth, and as the mayor indicated, that, um, that uh, it is our expectation that these golf courses uh, will be there um, uh, for uh, forever in the Coquitlam scene. But I just wanted to highlight a few of the issues that, uh, that are barriers in the way of, uh, of anything occurring along those lines. Uh, both of the golf courses that um, are, are the subject of some of those discussions are protected uh, from development under the city's uh, official community plan uh, and through its uh, zoning process. Uh, and any kind of changes uh, to those processes would have to go through extensive processes uh, which would include a very extensive uh, community consultation and, and discussions and, and, and detailings uh, with the council. Uh, and, and as uh, in our discussions with the council, uh, I have not heard any member uh, of the council expressing any interest in even considering or starting any of those kind of processes. Uh, but the other aspect is there are development agreements linked back 
to the original development that do set up service uh, uh, servicing requirements and, and operational obligations that would have to be changed, uh, and that sets up a significant barrier in that regard. Uh, but not only that, the whole plateau was designed uh, considering that uh, those golf courses would be open space, green uh, space, and the services that are provided, extensive uh, storm sewer services and, and others, uh, simply uh, were not designed uh, with any other use in mind than a golf course, so that would have to be a significant uh, barrier to or any changes in that regard. But in terms of what is actually happening, uh, what is actually happening right now is not a Coquitlam process. It's a Metro Vancouver process to change their overall strategic, uh, strategic livable uh, uh, plan. Uh, that original plan was put in 20 years ago, uh, and it was done relatively quickly. And, uh, and there was a whole host of inconsistencies across the region that have been highlighted over the coming years, uh, and it is also very difficult to administer. So there's fundamental unfairness in the way that plan has been rolled out across the region. But because uh, it was very difficult to change, uh, the amending formulas were very difficult uh, given the, uh, the regional setup, that uh, it was fundamentally seen as, as something that absolutely had to change. And Metro Vancouver has been uh, discussing those kind of changes and rolling out a number of proposals over the last couple of years uh, in terms of how they see things uh, should be changed. Uh, so, I mean, um, with respect to uh, the specifics uh, of the green zone, which, uh, which is one of the subjects that is being discussed, uh, I'd just like to highlight that the green zone Metro Vancouver is discussing now is significantly different than the green zone that was covered under the 20-year-old plan. So it's very difficult to actually compare uh, the, the two processes uh, because they're defined differently. The method of changing them once they are defined is significantly different. And so it's very important uh, to be consistent across the region, and the current green zone is not consistent across the region. So there's a number of tests uh, that both the region and all the local municipalities across the region have highlighted that that needs to be uh, met before uh, properties uh, like like uh, like what are under consideration would be considered uh, under the new uh, green zone concept. And some of those tests that would have to be met is that they have to be regionally significant. Uh, the region should not get into local government parks or any issues like that. And, and also one of the other major tests that in most cases they should, uh, uh, the properties under consideration should be publicly owned because this is a more rigorous process now. There is a greater need for fairness and consistency across the region. So those, uh, those points um, have to be kept in mind as we move forward. Uh, so when, when we look at uh, what kinds of properties should be included in, in the green zone. It's things like uh, the Coquitlam Lake watersheds, it's things like uh, Pine Coke Burke Provincial Park, uh, a whole host of other kinds of issues, the regional parks in Minicata, uh and Colony Farm area. Uh, the, the major, the major uh, Coquitlam Park, Monday Park, which is of size that is regionally significant, uh, would be included. All those are public in public hands and, and would be included in the new green zone. Issues that wouldn't be included in the new, new green zone are privately owned properties, privately owned golf courses. So when you look across the region, uh, there are significant inconsistencies. For example, in the Vancouver area, the Shaughnessy Golf Course was never in the green zone, uh, even though it has been there for 100 years and uh, would be there uh, for all time, but because it was privately owned, was not deemed to be the, the kind of uh, facility that would be um, in the regional plan. And by the same token, uh, the two privately owned Coquillum golf courses under the latest plan of Metro, uh, one is highlighted as not in the green zone, uh, the other is highlighted as uh, maybe it should have been. Uh, we have pointed out those inconsistencies. Uh, we believe it's inappropriate uh, for those kind of in inconsistencies to occur in, in such a regional plan and that those should be uh, rationalized uh, before it's finalized. So uh, those are some of the issues that are, that are going on. Th there is ongoing consultation. 
Uh, it is a regional process. The region is hosting uh, public meetings on this and ultimately there will be a significant amount of, of discussion uh, that is going forward uh, on these issues before it ever uh, will occur. Uh, the city has not received any development proposals for these lands and questions and in my discussions with uh, with uh, any of the councillors there is uh, no councillor uh, that has expressed any interest in even discussing those so we just felt it was very important uh, to make that statement to correct any inaccurate statements that are circulating in the community we have uh, provided some of these notes in an update a memo for council's information that we have just circulated so and we'll provide that by e-format tomorrow so if anybody wants to s send that on to anybody who wants uh, this kind of information in writing that will be available first thing in the morning. Uh, Jim McIntyre, Director of Planning uh, is here if there are any questions uh, on any of the technical matters and he's certainly pr more prepared uh, to talk about some of the technical aspects of that uh, uh, that I've highlighted if there are any questions in that regard. Thank you very much. This is an unusual process and, and council agreed that we ought to be doing it tonight because there was an unusual level of angst in the community about uh, what was really based on a misunderstanding of what was, uh, what, what's going on. This is a regional process. It wasn't initiated by our council, it's initiated by the region and the goal here is to make sure that the regional plan reflects uh, the best principles of planning and one of those is the principle that privately owned land shouldn't shouldn't be in a conservation zone um, the, that if you're going to do that you pretty much have to as, as government step forward and, and purchase privately owned land um, but also the commitment that council um, every single member of council has made that statement that no this is that's not on uh, West the, the golf the golf courses up in uh, Westwood Plateau are not up for development period are there any questions of council of staff Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure all of council will be uh, prepared uh, after the council meeting. Any of us that you want to ask specific questions to, you can. Um, I, I'll be here uh, after the council meeting out in the lobby, so make sure that's fine, or by email or by telephone if you still have questions related to this. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the next item on our agenda, item three, concerns the minutes of the regular council meeting held Monday, January 18th. The recommendations to approve those minutes. Moved by Councillor Reamer, seconded by Councillor Lynch. All in favor, opposed, carried. Item four is the minutes of the Land Use and Economic Development Standing Committee meeting held Monday, January 25th. The recommendations to receive those minutes. Moved by Councillor Robinson, seconded by Councillor Reamer. All in favor, opposed, carried. Item of business arising out of that meeting concerns an authorization for a time extension of, of a development permit at 2992 Glen Drive and 1155 The High Street. It's a proposed mixed residential and commercial development. The recommendation is to extend the initial period for an additional one-year period. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Item five is the Minister of the Engineering, Utilities and Environment Standing Committee meeting held Monday, January 25th. The recommendation is to receive those minutes. Second. Moved by Councillor Lynch, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor, opposed, carried. Item of business arising out of that meeting, 5.2, concerns the 2010 to 2014 pavement rehabilitation program and funding plan. Uh, the recommendation is that council approve the revised priorities to this plan as shown in attachment A. Uh, including the advancement of the pavement rehabilitation on Louis and Barnett highways that approve in accordance with section 175 of the community charter that the use of short-term financing from the municipal finance authority in the amount of 9.6 million dollars to fund the city's contribution uh, to the Loig Barnett project which were payment from the funding included in the future years of the five-year financial plan for road paving three request that TransLink allow use of future OMR funds towards repayment of the city's short-term borrowing for the Loig Barnett project and finally, that TransLink be requested to increase OMR funding to adequately maintain the region's major road network. Moved by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor McDonnell. All in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. Item six um, concerns the C of Coquitlam Street and traffic bylaw amendment bylaw 4097. The recommendations that Council give consideration of fourth and final reading of the street and traffic bylaw amendment bylaw. Moved by Councillor Asmussen, second by Councillor Lynch. All in favor, opposed, carried unanimously. 
Item 7 is a report of the General Manager of Planning and Development. It concerns bylaw amendments related to the proposed tree management bylaw number 4091. These are the fees and charges amendment bylaw, 4100, an amendment to bylaw 4076, and bylaw notice enforcement bylaw amendment bylaw 4101. And this is amendment to bylaw number 3749. The recommendation is that Council give first, second, and third readings to the Fees and Charges Amendment Bylaw Number 4100, and that Council give first, second, and third readings to Bylaw Notice Enforcement Bylaw Amending Bylaw Number 4101. Moved by Councillor Reamer, second by Councillor Asmussen. All in favor? Oops. Opposed? Carried. Oh, Councillor Robinson is opposed. The motion so carries. So am I. That's why I had my light on. But that's our. Um, Councillor Sikori, you're going to have to indicate your uh, willingness. If you, if you do want to speak to an item, you have to push um, your request. Oh. Uh, okay, I'm, we're going to do this again then. Sure. Okay. Uh, no, I just, I, I just want uh, an explanation one more time about the, the buttons. Sure. And um, again, uh, apologize for the, uh, the new situation with regard to audio. In order to indicate a preference to speak, um, just the normal request button as we would use at any period of time um, can be requested and the name of each council will appear in the queue. Got two yeah, that was yes. explained before the meeting. We've got... Yes. I, I don't know you've requested to speak unless it shows up on the request to speak uh, and the order in which people push their buttons will be still, still on the request to speak system. Unfortunately, the amplifier for that system doesn't operate, so we've brought in another microphone system as, as uh, the clerk explained. So I'm going to uh, back off from, uh, okay, no, okay. Mr. Clerk. Um, just to be sure, Mr. Uh, Councillor Sikori, do you wish to speak at this time or? Uh, get, not your request to speak now, it's just your microphone. Okay. There you go. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, Mayor. The, uh, <clears throat> on this three bylaw, the fact is that, you know, one paper wrote up the fact is that I was against removing two trees in people's backyards. That wasn't a fact. That certainly wasn't true. And the fact is that, you know, the two, three bylaw, removing two trees were in the old bylaw, which I... Uh, voted against removal, and the new three bylaw I voted against it was because, number one, while though we're getting an environmental committee in this city hall, we seem to do a lot of work ahead of time to clean up things that wouldn't, they wouldn't have much work to do when they get in here. We're, we, somebody can buy 500 acres, 200 acres, 125 acres of land, clear cut it, and that's the end. You know, those are the things that I object to. I didn't object to one or two trees being cut in, a, in, in, a, in any particular yard. So those are the things that are, you know, was quoted in the paper, it was wrong, okay? And I know that the reporter himself said he was gonna clarify it. I don't know, he may have by this time, so, but I don't mean any harm to any news media or anybody else. I'm just saying why I voted against that bylaw, okay? Thank you. Okay, well, we've already voted on this one. Uh, it was Councillor Zakora and Councillor Robinson were opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. The next item, item eight, is a notice of motion. It concerns the Metro Vancouver Board of the Directors. Uh, this most motion was introduced last week and was moved and seconded, moved by Councillor Sakora and seconded by Councillor Lynch. Um, the motion is that uh, the recommendation is Council give consideration of the following notice of motion. And the therefore be resolved clauses are that the Council for the City of Coquitlam requests that the provincial government amend the Local Government Act in order to explicitly allow that the City's representatives at Metro Vancouver be chosen by the electors of the City as part of each general and local election. And secondly, that therefore be resolved that a copy of this resolution be sent to Metro Vancouver and all of its members' municipalities for their information and consideration. Okay. Uh Motion was moved and seconded. Uh, Councillor Asmussen. Thank you very much. I guess just a point of clarification. Um, we're talking about directly elected. Are we asking that we're asking that the Metro Board be a separately elected with a separate set of powers? I mean, the devil's in the detail here. We're saying we want a directly elected representative, but we don't have the details of what we mean by a directly elected representative. Does it mean that we're endorsing Metro Vancouver as a separate elected body that's elected directly 
are we asking that it, it is a councillor that is elected with the highest number of votes? I, I don't know exactly what I'm voting on here. Yes, directly elected, but in what form? The devil's in the detail here, and I don't know what the detail is on this one here moving forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lynch. Well, perhaps uh, Councillor Scori would like to speak to that, but I can give some, some background information because I had uh, a lengthy discussion before I second this motion. And what it is, is when there's an election, a civic election held, there'll be another spot on the ballot that will indicate whether the, the public want that person to be one of the representatives at Metro Vancouver. So first of all, you'd, you'd have to be one of the eight or nine, eight councillors or the mayor to be elected. And then it would go next to the amount of votes that each individual got in order to represent this council at a regional body. Uh, so if you didn't get elected to council, then you obviously couldn't represent Metro. And then it would be the top two people who are elected to council who also got votes to be the Metro representative. So that, that was my understanding of it. I think the, um, the concern, and I actually brought up something similar about, uh, about six years ago where I felt that uh, we should have more of a direct representation. And we're not, I don't see us ever going to a, an independent election for each one of the Metro directors. But this is a way of, instead of it being um, pretty much the councillors or the council deciding who's going to be the representative, it will be the actual public that decides who they want to represent this council at a regional level. And that could be the mayor, it probably would be the mayor, but it, it wouldn't have to be. It could theoretically be two councillors. It would, it would depend on um, how the general ele electorate voted. Thank you. Councillor Sakura. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Precisely correct. I think uh, that uh, Council Lynch uh, uh, addressed it fairly well. The fact is that, you know, years ago, going back into 72, 73, I was on council when, in fact, the board of directors for the GVRD were elected people by the taxpayers of this community who represented people directly on the board. Now it's either self-appointing or patronage appointments what I call, that's what they are, in this council anyway, I don't know about other council members, but in other cities, but the fact is, you know, we have a housing that has had a problem in the GVD. We've had waste that's been 10 years now, and nobody has addressed it, and they haven't resolved it. Sewer and water was $660 million. It went to $880 million and might be, well, in excess of billion after all the court cases are settled. Have we heard from any of our board of directors about it or even raising a concern at the board of directors of the GVD? No, we haven't. We haven't heard a thing. The fact is that, you know, they go there for an hour and a half. Not only that, not only that, the great part about it is that, you know what, now the staff gives the politicians a raise around that board. The staff gives the politicians a raise at that board. They don't vote for a raise for themselves. It's the staff that gives them the raise, you know. And, and the fact is, that you know what it is. And I, I'll tell you. Now I'll tell you. It's a funny darn thing. I sat on a GVD. Didn't sit on a GVD. I sat on a GVD for many, many years. But however, I went to two meetings this year. And I'll tell you. My total paycheck, which I think the media would probably like to have a copy of it, says zero, zero, zero. I didn't take any money. And, and the fact is one of our council members made a smart remark, and I call it a smart remark, saying that's all you're worth. You know, I mean, those are things that do go on in these council chambers, you know, that uh, makes me a little irky. But the fact is the taxpayers of this community is very simple. You apply, you apply to go to the GVD. When the election comes up, you have a right to file whether you're going to run for council and a GVD or you're going to run for mayor and GVD. And the taxpayers, this community, judge who should represent them in at the GVD. The more votes, the more the, the more votes is in other words, you'd be like an elected body. If you come up on a top, your top two would be the representative on the GVD. 
and that's a matter whether it's a mayor or two council members, like as Councillor Lynch said. But I think that we need to be more have more responsibility here at the GVD. What is happening? That it's like a closed shop in there. Don't rock the boat, and you shall be on a board. And if you vote like I vote at the GVD then you will be appointed again. Otherwise, I'm not gonna appoint you. Well, you know what? It's a little too much power in one hand. So I think that, you know what, rightfully so, I think the taxpayers of this community have a right to appoint whoever they want for the GVD. And whoever it is, is appointed for the three years, the same length of time as the council member sits, and whoever it is, I'd have a lot of respect for that. But for what we have today, no, and I don't know why that was changed or anything else, but back in the 70s, everybody that wanted to be on a GVD board got elected. I don't think that there's any fairer way than that, and I know that our provincial government's in their charter that they don't have to be elected, but I think we're asking the provincial government to change the law, and if they don't, there's no reason why Coquitlam cannot have, uh, get their board elected for the GVD. That's all I'm going to say. I'm just going to clear up a couple of things there. Um, first of all, uh, GVRD staff don't set the remuneration set by the board uh, of, GV, of Metro Vancouver. Um, and I don't appoint people. The mayor's office doesn't, and the mayor doesn't appoint people to GVRD. That's appointed by council. Uh, that's under the Local Government Act. Um, by the team. By the council. Um, and we actually, we actually submitted... Uh, Councillor Sikora's name for one of those, but it wasn't accepted by uh, Metro Vancouver. Councillor Reamer. Thank you. Well, I fully support uh, Councillor Sikora's motion, and, and I want to thank him very much uh, for bringing this forward. Um, I think it's really important for the taxpayers of our community uh, to elect our Metro Vancouver uh, directors, uh, especially when you consider that many of the costs uh, our taxpayers pay um, are a result of decisions that do come out of Metro Vancouver. Uh, the second point I want to make um, with regards to what we go through every year uh, around the council table, and that is we end up having to decide uh, which of our council members are going to sit on Metro Vancouver, um, especially when there's only three positions are required um, and we've got uh, seven people who would like to sit on Metro Vancouver. It makes it very difficult. It's a very difficult choice for us. And so I think um, making this a part of the election process and, and, and having the rules set out in advance are very important uh, to ensuring fairness um, in the appointment of or the election in this case of our directors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Reid. Thank you. Well, I have been on council for many years, probably too many to count for a lot of people. I've only sat on Metro Vancouver because it was not something I chose to do because I worked. Um, I have sat on it for two years. Uh, I was on it as an alternate for someone who couldn't make a meeting, but I'd never been on the board in probably 18 years. Uh, about Five, eight years ago, our council decided when uh, Councillor Diane Thorne was here, who is now our MLA, decided that at that time, we had a long talk about it, that it shouldn't just be the same people going down to Metro Vancouver making all the decisions, that we should take turns so that every member of council would get a year on and then another year as the alternate to the mayor so that there'd be rotation, fairness, and also experience. And experience is really an important thing. We all take for granted that our water and sewer and everything sort of arrive at our doorstep. We all take for granted that the water is clean, clear, and, and, and good to drink. We all take it for granted that the roads are going to be there and the transportation systems and all these things. But when you get down to Metro Vancouver, you actually get the experience of knowing how all this stuff happens. I think it's invaluable to change. The only problem I have with it is that when you get down there, it is a high learning curve. It's a very high learning curve. So when I look at what Councillor Sikora 
is trying to do. In some ways, I think it's good that perhaps there could be continuity, but then that stops other than the two members of council that are there for three years. The others could go once in a blue moon, so to speak, down as an alternate, but they don't get the benefit of the experience. Let me tell you when you're down there, it certainly changes your, your idea and knowing the largesse of, of the things that this region has to go through to deliver services to all of us. And we all fight like crazy for costs, so that, that's not true. We fight like crazy because we have to come back after we're responsible for our decision in Metro. We have to come back knowing full well we're bringing our proportionate share to, to our citizens and, and we're paying it ourselves. The problems that I see are some people feel that the mayor should also, in Coquitlam, by the way, we have two members of council that go there and it's all based on population, et cetera, et cetera. So we've had two members of council for a while. Port Moody has one, Port Coquitlam has one, I mean, just for examples. The problem is, is that we always assume that the mayor should be one. And then it would be up to the other one to be elected or appointed or whatever from the rest of council. And that, according to this, is going to be sort of in perpetuity for the three years and then what happens to the alternates? How do new members of council coming on get experience? And to be honest, what if they're a lot brighter than the members of council that are already sitting there? You know, there's a lot to be said for experience. There's a lot to be said for continuity in this job. And I just think that it would be just too difficult to do this. I really do. Um, I've thought about this a lot because some days I think it's better if someone's there for three years and knows everything that goes on. I have um, been there. I've been on the Water Committee, the Housing Committee, the Finance Committee, the, I can't remember all of them, the Port Committee. But, I mean, it's just, it's vast. The knowledge that you get is absolutely incredible. So for that reason, I, I can't support this. I feel that everyone should get that experience and be able to put in their good and valid opinions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reed. Councillor McDonnell. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Councillor Reed uh, actually took a lot of the points that I was going to make. Um, for a long time, I've thought that there should be some form of uh, a better representation on that board when, because when you, you look at it from the outside, you have um, members of, of Metro from Surrey and Vancouver and Burnaby making decisions about uh, Coquitlam and they're not um, accountable to our residents. And so there's a very good argument made for uh, making them more accountable. I really don't know how that, how that would look. This, um, while I, I really, I applaud the, uh, the view of, of looking to reform that, uh, the, the way that we look and go down to, to Metro. I think this is pretty convoluted and I think that uh, it, it would be, there'd be a lot of confusion and uh, I don't think the general uh, public would really, uh, really understand what uh, the intent of this is. And, and I agree on council, uh, we all need, um, we all need uh, the experience of being down there. We, uh, we grow as councillors by being uh, uh, involved with uh, uh, outside um, councils. And uh, to send two down and only two uh, right off the bat without um, looking to see what uh, opportunities the rest of council presents, I, I think is just uh, I don't, I don't agree with it, so um, I won't be supporting this. However, I, do, I would support uh, re-looking at how uh, Metro Vancouver does uh, represent Coquitlam. Thank you, Councillor McDonnell. I have a few comments of my own. Um, Metro Vancouver, like it or not, and a lot of people don't like it, um, does some incredibly important work. It's got an important role in this community in this region. It uh, 
allows that every community can have access to clean water, every community can have access to sewage treatment. Um, all kinds of effort gets put in at the regional level on issues that are regional in nature. And uh, there's also the reality that every single member of the Metro Vancouver Board and its committees are elected. They are elected by the people of their community to serve in the capacity uh, to represent and make decisions on behalf of their community. And some of them get sent to Metro Vancouver to represent their community at Metro Vancouver. I actually don't mind the thought of having uh, them elected in some way. I'm glad that this motion actually is somewhat vague in the way uh, in which they would be elected because I, the, the way it was described earlier, um, I, I don't know that that would ever work uh, viably. Um, I also fully support the, con the, the thoughts expressed by Councillor Reed and Councillor McDonnell, for example, on the experience and the knowledge, uh, the regional perspective that comes out of a regional view. The, the, the sitting at the regional table allows one to get the concepts, the issues that other communities face, the challenges that other communities face, and allows us to realize that we have to work together, community with community, in order to make our region work as well as it possibly can. I'm fine with this motion um, because it is vague. It says find a way to elect them, and there may be a way to elect them. Uh, directly from by the by each voter. I suspect, though, that the rotational uh, approach that count, the Coquitlam Council adopted a number of years ago has a has a great many advantages and, and ought perhaps to to be the way that we continue to do that. But I'm not adverse to to contemplating um, electing our representatives. Okay. So the question: All in favor? Opposed? Um, Okay, Councillor McDonnell, Councillor, uh, okay, we're, we're going to lose, but Councillor McDonnell, Councillor Robinson, Councillor Asmussen, Councillor Reed are opposed. The motion is tied and therefore fails. Mr. Clerk. Next item, item nine, is a second notice of motion. It concerns the smoking bylaw. The recommendations that council give consideration to the following notice of motion presented by Councillor Robinson and seconded by Councillor Lynch at the January 18th regular council meeting. Uh, following a series of whereas clauses, um, the therefore be resolved clauses are that the city of Coquitlam develop a ban on smoking on public patios and spaces where minors under 16 years of age might be present that the City of Coquitlam invite municipalities in Metro Vancouver that have yet to develop smoking bans to consider such a ban, and that the City of Coquitlam ask the province to consider a ban on smoking in all public places. Thank you. That motion was put on the floor at the last meeting by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Lynch. Councillor Robinson. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, consider actually deferring the vote on this uh, um, notice of motion. I understand there's a staff report um, and I would like to know how soon the staff report can come before council and we can have a, f a richer discussion about the issue. Let's see, Mr. Wingrove. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, staff are actively working on a report now that uh, contemplates a smoking ban in uh, some public places and uh, it's expected that that report would be finished up in the next uh, four weeks or so and uh, those uh, possible bylaw amendments including a uh, process for public participation would be included within that staff report. Well, I'd be fine to wait for that report to come forward and, and hold this out. Motion by Councillor Robinson, second by Councillor Aspenson to defer pending the receipt of a staff report at a future council meeting. Any discussion on the motion to defer? Seeing none. All in favor of deferral? Opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, that is the final formal, formal item on t t this evening's agenda. Um, Councillor Sikora. Councillor Sikora, you have to activate your microphone, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the question that was on the, on the notice of motion about experience and a few other things carries a long ways. Well, let me remind council members. I was sitting on a GVD board for about 20 years. So if that's not experience, what else is? I chaired the parks recreation for about five years. 
I chaired the housing for five years, and I was the one that put that waste management deal at Cash Creek. Now, that's not experience what is, and I'm not looking for that at all, that somehow I have the most experience, so therefore I should sit on it. Not at all. I'm not interested in the uh, Councillor Sakura, um, a motion actually, that, uh, that item was moved, seconded, voted on after the following debate, and we really can't, re doing, we can't re-debate it. Yeah, I know, Mayor, you hate anything to be clarified that was discussed that was wrong. Okay, well, Councillor Sakura, if you wanted to clarify no, it. No, no, that's fine, Mayor. Thank you very much. Okay, well, now I could perhaps turn to Councillor Reed because she says that you're misrepresenting what she said, so I could ask her to clarify that. And the motion was voted right. on. And, and we can't really open the yeah. floor to debate again. And, Mayor, that's precisely what I'm saying, that some of the things that were said uh, at that time in a debate, and I had my button on, you didn't recognize it. I know that I would have been asking to speak for the second time. You'd have to have a vote on council, which is fine. But the fact is... Councillor Sikora, I'm sorry, we, we can't re-debate an issue Thank that's already much. been voted on. Thank you very much. Yeah, those are procedures that all of council voted on. Thank you. Um, just before we do that, I wanted to make sure that everyone feels welcome. This is the last council meeting before what promises to be the biggest event in Coquitlam's history. On February 11th, the morning of February 11th, the torch will come through our community. Uh, I invite you to find out the torch route and uh, join on the torch route wearing red and, and participate fully, or even better, come on down to Mackin Park. Don't drive down, there'll be no parking. Uh, come down to Mackin Park between 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock for what promises to be the biggest gathering of people in Coquitlam's history to celebrate the torch at the cauldron at the celebration site at Mackin Park. And all council members will be there and a lot of our staff will be there. There's going to be hundreds and hundreds of children performing. Uh, uh, there's so much excitement in our community and I make, want to make sure that people don't miss it. That's February 11th, Thursday morning, the morning before the torch makes its way into the big dome for the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games. So please come on down. A motion to adjourn would be in order. Moved by Councillor Robbins, second by Councillor Reamer. All in favor of adjourning, opposed. That carries unanimously as well. I'll now, uh, as is our, uh, our council procedure, open the floor for questions related to tonight's agenda. Are there any items on tonight's agenda that people have questions about? Please approach the microphone. You'll have to activate the microphone. Oh, so. Someone will activate it for you. Uh, council procedures allow a single question, please up to two minutes, but no preambles, just the question, and we'll try and answer as many as we possibly can on tonight's agenda. Uh, please state your name and address for the record. The rules of the question period are on the screen ahead of us. These are rules approved by council so that we can get as many questions in as possible. Please go ahead, name and address. Okay, uh, my name is Tania Sanchez, and my address is 3321 Plateau Boulevard. And I have a question in regards of the change of wording for the um, the, um, the golf course, um, uh, the golf um, country club. Um, uh, if um, my um, my concern is if uh, the word get changed to um, to an um, uh, general urban rather than a uh, uh, recreation and conservation area. Uh, when the, re, uh, the RGS passes, um, that means that it won't require a uh, public hearing. That means that if you guys want to change it, well, I have here the paper. It, it states, you know, to make any amendments to a uh, general, general urban area, you, it only requires a 50% plus one weighted vote at Metro Vancouver Board. No rational public hearing required. This is not accepted yet. I know it's on the hearings, but. I want to thank you for asking the question because it's clear that that's, that hasn't been made clear. Um, that's the process at Metro Vancouver. The, metro, the process that governs us and how we can change a land use always involves a public hearing. If we're going to rezone, if we're going to remove something or change its designation in our official community plan, all of those require public hearings. And there's a very extensive process as laid out by Mr. Stebland. Um, that, that, that statement only relates to how it would go, uh, how it would get uh, go through the channels at Metro Vancouver because um, the land use decisions in this community are all made by this council and we're governed by the Local Government Act as to how we uh, set forth and gather public opinion and make sure the best decision gets made. 
Yeah, I understand that, but my question is why is it that the City Council is proposing to change that, um, the name uh, to uh, General Urban, you know, rather than Recreational uh, Conservational Area? In these uh, meetings that you have adjourned for last, um, last um, a meeting that you have here in January, um, uh, the January 18 report, it says that you guys are, uh, um, are leaving this contingent to, to the, uh, to the um, to the Metro Vancouver. However, in there also states that in the, in the staff report in January 8, you, the city staff, you know, um, they uh, uh, recommend, they are rec recommending that the RGS uh, changes the name of private, uh, the private golf um, course lands from conservation recreation area to general urban area. And I wonder why is this being pushed by the city council and uh, what, what, okay. is, what, what is going to be the long term? It, it, it was know? explained in some detail. I'm going to look to Mr. Steblin to, to explain it again. Uh, this, the, this is essentially to remain consistent with how other private golf courses are dealt with around Metro Vancouver, but I'll ask Mr. Yeah. Steblin. Uh, just to clarify that, uh, please be assured that there will be a public hearing if there are any land use changes that are contemplated by anybody. Uh, as we explained earlier, there are no uh, contemplated changes for the golf courses in uh, Westwood Plateau. Uh, but because of uh, that it's included as a golf course in both Coquitlam's official community plan and it's zoned that way, there would be a public hearing and an opportunity to comment at that time. Uh, the, the difficulties with the uh, regional uh, district uh, situation is, as I explained earlier, uh, they have an outdated plan that needs to be changed and there are significant inconsistencies uh, with their current plan uh, and there is also some real difficulties in updating them uh, and evolving them. They have actually found that it was very, very difficult to go through the amendment procedure uh, that they had. So they talked about uh, changing uh, the plan. In, in, in some ways, uh, to, to the layperson, it, it's hard to understand the changes, but when you really get into the details, uh, there is some significant fundamental differences in the way the plan um, is thought about, described, uh, and administered and if and it has shown up a number of inconsistencies across the region in terms of how a variety of issues um, are, are, are dealt with uh, and so there's a number of principles that all municipalities across the region have highlighted that need to, to be done. One of the issues is that anything that is included in the regional district green zone needs to be of a scale and order of magnitude that is properly debated region-wide. Uh, another is that private properties should be looked at different than public properties because the whole concept that they're dealing with is more uh, those kind of park settings and those kind of issues. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, there is, there is a need for consistency. There is a need for fairness across the region. And at the present time, there are neither. And so the region, is leading an effort to sort of promote that consistency and fairness and equity. And all member municipalities need to be involved in terms of making sure anything that's done on a Metro Vancouver level is done uh, in a consistent uh, way. And that is why Coquitlam adopted certain principles. It does not mean Coquitlam is any uh, less vigilant in terms of protecting that green space that we have but that is something that we believe should be dealt with at the local table as opposed to somebody where you don't have access to and, uh, and uh, as the last motion highlighted uh, the, the board reps at the regional table are not elected uh, at the present time they're appointed through the various councils so some would argue that there's less accountability there than in, in other ways uh, all of that uh, from, from our perspective, we believe that there is <coughs> adequate protection and that certainly the residents uh, of Coquitlam uh, can rest easy that there are absolutely no contemplated changes to the land use designations um, of the different golf courses in Coquitlam. Thank you. Thank well, you very much. Um, I want to remind 
uh, and I thank you for the question. The, the item of the golf course actually wasn't on the agenda, but I did allow the question because I do want to make sure we're going to bend over backwards to make sure that any misunderstanding on this is cleared up right away. Uh, the golf course is not being developed. Uh, Jane Thompson, 3085 Primrose Lane. Just a quick question with regards to the deferral of the smoking bylaw. I understand there's going to be a staff report come out, and I heard public input, and I'm just wondering to be clear. Is this, uh, this in the staff report, it may recommend that there be a public input or will there be a public input before you have a chance to vote on the smoking bylaw? Mr. Wingrove. Uh, Microphone's not on, there we go. Uh, through the chair, uh, actually it would be both. There will be a staff report that comes forward uh, with a draft bylaw for council consideration and part of that will include a notion of uh, how to solicit public feedback on the draft bylaw. Thank you. Any other questions? We yeah. step forward, name and address for the record. Uh, Tom Cox, 1465 Parkway Boulevard. And uh, I'm with the Westwood Plateau Community Association. And I thank you for uh, addressing the subject of the uh, golf land tonight. I just had a couple of questions. Uh, one is the, uh, that I mentioned to you before, uh, what would happen legally if we don't make that change and leave it as uh, conservation recreation? And the second was, did I understand that Mr. Stebbin tomorrow would have some literature that we could give residents or something to? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, what to Mr. Stebbin? Uh, yes, uh, it's actually coming out of our uh, planning area. Mr. McIntyre, who I believe you know, uh, uh, has a memo distributed. It will be available in e-format. And uh, Jim, if you could get uh, the gentleman's email address and send him a copy either later tonight or first thing tomorrow morning, uh, that would be uh, that would be appreciated. And Jim can talk about that after I, I address your first part of the question. Uh, the, the issue. Um, you know, there are, there's a lot of potential uh, legal concerns with a variety of issues. Many of those issues are not tested in court. Uh, the, uh, the issue uh, is one of fundamental fairness um, and the need for consistency, and that uh, is basically just simple good governance principles. And if, and if different people's properties are treated differently, it it raises potential concerns in a variety of areas. And, and when you deal with good public uh, policy, there is an onus on us to look at similar properties and ensure they are treated similarly, especially if they're privately owned, because the owners of those properties can start, you know, looking at inconsistencies and raising all sorts of cases, which nobody wants to go down. And as I highlighted earlier, uh, the first green zone had many inconsistencies with it, and it is being drastically changed and redefined. So it's really difficult to actually compare the old green zone to the new green zone because of the many differences. And I'll just highlight a, a couple that if anybody who were the owners highlighted, uh, legally I'm not sure we could adequately defend what is there, but. For example, a privately owned golf course that has been in existence for 100 years in Vancouver that has more or at least as much uh, history and significance than many other golf courses, which is just for example the Shaughnessy Golf Course, but there's other golf courses as well, are not included in the green zone. They're still protected uh, by Vancouver zoning and a variety of other uh, issues, and there is no uh, thought on anybody's part that that would ever be redeveloped or, or changed in use, but it's not included in the metro uh, uh, green zone. Then you move forward to the Coquillum situation, and we have two uh, significant golf courses in Coquillum, both of which are privately owned, and under the latest draft of the, of the metro plan, one was included in the green zone and one was not. Uh, we are at a loss from the staff perspective to explain to anybody uh, why. It's like splitting hairs or, you know, I mean, they're, they're both uh, similar uh, properties of similar stature and that kind of stuff. There is a need to treat private property consistently. We believe protection is very important and we believe that protection resides in Coquitlam's official community plan and zoning, which is very clear 
Uh, with the uh, Westwood golf courses, there's added protection because there's actually a development agreement that talks about public access to a golf course in perpetuity. Uh, and how can there be public access if there is no golf course or a different golf course? So, I mean, there's all sorts of protection that's included in, in Coquitlam's aspect. But when you get into the region as a whole, it becomes uh, very difficult to deal with the local concerns because where would you go? Who would you appeal to? Uh, your rep on the Metro Board uh, would only have one vote out of 30. We have two reps, but it would be two votes out of 30. And, and sometimes the very important local concerns that we have in our community may not be dealt with uh, in the manner that our citizens would want. And that's why we believe that those, uh, uh, th those protections should ultimately rest with, uh, with the Coquitlam Council. Thank you. I'm actually going to add one little uh, subtlety to that. Uh, for example, a, a city cannot, a council cannot rezone a piece of land to be parkland if it's privately owned and council has no interest in buying it as a park. We cannot sterilize land and essentially putting land in a conservation zone has the same effect or potentially has the same effect. So it's private land, 